All right, so good morning and afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to our fourth day of Donor Experience Week. Uh, my name is Samantha Lego, as mentioned. I'm Keyless Marketing Director. We've got Mel in the background fielding all of your tech questions, so feel free to say hi to her today. Uh, before we jump into things, I just want to start by acknowledging that here in Vancouver, we are on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil First Nations, and I want to give thanks for their generosity and hospitality on these lands and waters. We're super excited to have you all participating in Kila's five-day virtual conference. If you've attended our sessions so far, welcome back. And if you're just tuning in now, welcome and thanks for joining us. Before we begin this 60-minute session, I wanted to say a quick thank you not only to our speakers who have donated their time, but also to our sponsors, Imagine Canada, Pano, and The Good Partnership. Without them, we wouldn't be able to put on free educational events like Donor Experience Week. And while we can't meet you face-to-face -face right now, we can still network digitally. Uh, that's why I recommend jumping into our community forum. You can treat it as the lunch line between sessions. Uh, our goal is to help you connect with like-minded peers and continue the conversation even after these sessions end. And with that, I'm excited to introduce our speaker for today's session. Ross Kimborowski is the founder and CEO of Crowdspring and the Startup Foundry. In 2007, he left a successful 13-year career as a trial lawyer, lawyer to pursue his dream of founding a technology company. That was the start of Crowdspring a marketplace for crowdsourced logo, web, graphic, and product design, and for company naming services. He's the author of the ebook Stand Out. Now, you would have received many emails from me asking you to submit your graphic assets, so thank you to the many nonprofits who submitted logos, websites, landing pages, and images. Ross and his team will speak more about the importance of creating a strong visual brand while also giving you personalized feedback on those assets. Your bravery has helped shape this session, so thank you. And we encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation and in the Q&A or chat box, and we will get to them at the end. And don't worry, you will receive the recording along with the slide deck at the end of the conference. I'd also like to mention that by attending this webinar, you are eligible to receive one CFRE credit. If you check the chat, there will be a link there with a Donor Experience Week CFRE tracking sheet. You can download a copy and keep track of which sessions you've attended. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to mel at melissa.bilco at kilo.com. So with all of that out of the way, I'd like to give a very warm welcome to Ross. Well, thanks so much, Samantha. Uh, happy to be with all of you uh, talking about brand identity. Uh, it's a very important topic. It's a big topic, so we're not gonna be able to cover all of it today, uh, but we're gonna do our best to get into it. It's gonna be two parts. Uh, first, I'm gonna walk through a series of slides just to set uh, a little bit of the foundation to help all of us speak the same language when it comes to brand identity. And then we're gonna work hand in hand with all of you. This is where you take over and you're presenting. We're gonna talk about examples from people that are in this webinar. So people who've submitted their nonprofit for review and then together, we're gonna look at their brand identities. We're gonna look at their logos, their websites and other things that we can evaluate and then see if we can work to constructively improve and find the areas that maybe um, are not nearly as powerful as they can be. So um, let me share my screen. And in a moment, I'll start the slides. Okay, hopefully everybody sees uh, uh, the title slide. Uh, there's a link on the title slide and there's the same link on the last slide in the presentation. This is a very comprehensive nonprofit branding guide. It's about 13,000 words. It covers far more than what we're going to talk about today uh, and will give you lots of tools and resources. So I definitely encourage you at some point when you have the chance uh, to make several pots of coffee and read it. It'll, it's going to take a little bit of time. So ultimately, and let me see why I can't advance my presentation. There we go. Um, Samantha mentioned a few things about us, so I'm not gonna dwell on this, but we've been in business for 12 years. We've been helping nonprofits, uh, businesses, and, and agencies with all sorts of visual design from logos to websites to marketing. And so we've interacted with hundreds, if not thousands of nonprofits and certainly tens of thousands of businesses. And, and something that's relevant to, to many of you, we have a program we started back when we launched CrowdSpring in 2008 called Give Back. Uh, and there's a link to that program on the slide where once a month we try to help a worthy nonprofit with free design services. And so there's a process to apply. Uh, we'll ask for some information. One of the most significant mistakes that people make when they think about design, and this isn't just in the nonprofit world, but, but this is pretty much everywhere, 
is they feel design might be a little bit expensive. And the problem is, and there's a great quote from Dr. Ralph Speth, who is the CEO of Jaguar and Land Rover. Um, and let me actually, so that it's not in the way, see if I can move the, there we go, move the videos. Um, if you think good design is expensive, you should look at the cost of bad design. And this is true for any kind of nonprofit or for-profit organization. The challenge with bad design is that it creates friction. It creates an opportunity for whoever is looking at your organization to say no, to go somewhere else. And that's obviously not good. And, and the best way for me to talk about it is there's this famous advertisement from McGraw-Hill magazine, and this was you know, several decades back, uh, that was targeting businesses and, and the need for businesses to tell stories. And of course, you know, this is a for-profit focused advertisement, but I wanted to take this and, and ask the question, what about nonprofits? What challenges do they face? And, and so this is where we end up. When people first interact with your organization, they don't know who you are. They don't know your nonprofit at all. Uh, they don't know your mission, they don't know your values, they don't really know the community you serve, they don't know your reputation, but you want something from them. The whole point of your nonprofit, whether it's an online presence or if you are participating in a real world conversation with people, is to ask them for donations, to ask them to volunteer, to ask them to engage in some kind of social civic activities. So it's important for you to be able to tell a coherent story. And these are the kinds of questions that you have to ask. One of the fundamental mistakes most nonprofits make is to think that their logo is their brand. The logo is a tiny, tiny part of your brand, tiny part of your brand identity. Your brand identity is everything visual. And importantly, it's what you and other people can see. So it's your logo, it's your website, it's your marketing materials, business cards, it's the banners you create, it's the images that you share, it's the content you post on social networks. So it's everything visual. And how people perceive your brand, your nonprofit, is very important because there's often a disconnect. When we talk about our organizations, we wanna frame the conversation. That's important, but the most important thing is what people actually think of your organization. So that means that you can do one of two things. You can leave your brand identity to chance, or you can take over and be deliberate about it. Because at the end of the day, every single organization, whether you're a nonprofit, a for-profit, doesn't matter has a brand identity, how people perceive it. One of the best ways to talk about your brand and your brand identity is stories. This works particularly well for nonprofits. It obviously works for organizations of every type because people like listening to stories. It's the reason why podcasts have become so popular. It's the reason why um, audiobooks are popular, the reason why people read, and the reason why advertising, if done well, works well. Messages that tell stories are memorable and they're powerful. And stories help you educate your volunteers and donors about your mission and values because there is often a disconnect for nonprofits in particular between what you are saying and what your volunteers and donors are saying to other people. And if there is a disconnect, if what you're saying and what your volunteers and donors are saying are different, then your message is either gonna be diluted or confused, and that's not what you want, obviously. So one other element, symbols are very powerful, particularly for nonprofits, because they let you do a number of things. First of all, they let you create a symbol that's associated with your nonprofit that's unique. An American Red Cross is a very powerful symbol. When we see it, most people will often think of the American Red Cross, uh, or if it's, it's worldwide, the Red Cross. And so when you think about your own brand identity and the logo, ask yourself, do I have a symbol that represents my organization? Doesn't mean that every organization needs a symbol, but it is useful. Symbols also play a second role. You can put them on coffee cups, on t-shirts, on things that people will buy to promote your organization. And remember that every single decision you make, every action you take, every post on Twitter, on Facebook, every photo you share on Instagram for your nonprofit, 
every sentence you say on your website affects your brand and your brand identity. So it's not just the logo, it's everything. One way, and you'll see this in the nonprofit branding guide, this is a very popular tool to, to understand the opportunities, weaknesses, strength of your nonprofit. It's called a SWOT analysis. So one way for you to gather all of that information, whether you're starting a new nonprofit or you have an existing one and you're frustrated that you're not doing better and want to either rebrand or refocus, is to do what's called a SWOT analysis. And, and in, the non, in the branding guide for nonprofits, we go into detail about all of the kinds of questions you ask for each of these to identify your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats to your nonprofit. Now, let's talk about brand elements. So these are now your logo, your colors, and all the other things and what they should be. This is the foundation for our, for our conversation. They need to be memorable. People need to be able to remember these elements in order to remember your nonprofit. Visual memories are far more powerful than, than memories of words. So people perceive images 60,000 times faster than words. So if you have good imagery, if you have high quality imagery, people will remember. Don't get stuck in a situation like this. You have a lot of for-profit companies that are in the medical space using icons in their logos that look completely identical. Just slap a name, put it out there. All of these look identical. There's no way any person could remember and differentiate any of these organizations. And this is very common in the nonprofit space too. They need to be meaningful, meaning people need to take something away from it. If, if your brand identity, if your logo doesn't speak to your organization um, and, and completely misses the mark, people won't get it. Uh, they'll just be confused. They need to be likable. This is one of the biggest points of friction with a lot of nonprofits. If people react negatively to your branding. If they see a logo and they feel like it was done on Microsoft Paint or uh, it's not professionally done, you lose trust, you lose credibility. And because of the way we tend to make decisions, we make a decision that we don't like something, everything else they say creates friction. We just disagree with it. And this is very common. So they need to be transferable you need to be able to use them in lots of different settings on a small business card on a marketing brochure on a big banner at an event uh, for a fundraiser so they need to be flexible in that sense they need to be adaptable so so as culture evolves you don't want to keep changing your brand if you look at some of the most successful nonprofits you rarely see them every two or three years rebranding and that's because they've created a strong brand that people identify with and there's a cost to rebranding so while you should absolutely rebrand if you're stuck and need to find a fresh approach to move forward, you should find a brand that's adaptable. And finally, it needs to be protectable. So you need to be able to protect, meaning it has to be unique. It can't be a generic clip art or stock art that you use in your, in your logo um, or your other branding. It has to be something that's custom designed. And let me just walk you through a couple of very quick examples for a few minutes. These are, these are commercial logos. These are for-profit logos. But if we look at you know, these two examples, which is, is unique and more interesting, I suspect most of you will, will look and say, well, the Melia store logo isn't particularly unique and interesting because it has a picture of a hanger for a store. You can slap any other name in that store and it would still be perfectly fine, but generic and completely unremarkable. Whereas the Box Street logo is interesting because it has several elements. First of all, it's not typical to have a frog as an element. Second of all, if you look, it uses negative space very smartly. There's a guitar. This is a guitar shop. There's a guitar inside the frog. And that's a very cute way to create a unique and interesting brand that people will absolutely remember. Which of these is most, more versatile? You have one that's very busy, has a lot of elements. And again, you could slap any company name on the one on the left and say, that's fine. Beehive Beauty does something much more creative. There's a unique mark. And when I was talking about symbols earlier, that's a great example of developing a symbol you can use with or without the name of your organization. Which of these is more unique? You've got one that has a coffee cup on a coffee shop and one that has a picture of a space monkey for another business. So uh, think about ways that your nonprofit can differentiate both through the imagery and through the names, obviously, that don't make it seem like one of thousands of others. 
colors, very important as we get into the conversation in a few minutes. Um, both of these use pretty, pretty much one color. There's a variation on blue and there's a, there's a yellow, but the connection with the audience is very different and readability is very different. So window cleaning, when we clean windows, we wanna see the blue sky, we wanna see the outdoors. And that evokes a different kind of emotional reaction than the Serene Clinic one, which is kind of an awkward yellow. So uh, don't just pick a random color you like, think about the color that connects best with your audience. And actually in the nonprofit guide, we have a section on colors and what they mean psychologically to people. So that's a good place to look. Which of these is clean, simple, and easy to understand? The one on the left, very busy. There's a lot going on. It's hard to read. There are a lot of words. Not clean, it's not simple. The one on the right, Sugar High Records, very simple, clean and fun because it shows the picture of a record with a bite taken out of it, which is a nice way to create this memorable situation. Uh, two final points before we get into the conversation. I encourage all of you to create a brand style guide. This is really important for every organization, but, but, but for nonprofits in particular. We talk about it in the nonprofit branding guide. Um, a brand style guide lets you specify exactly how your logo is to be used, what colors are used throughout your branding on your website and marketing materials, the hex codes, the specific codes for digital, the CMYK codes for print, and everything about the fonts and, and all of the other branding elements that you have for your nonprofit. You do that because you want consistency. If a volunteer wants to create something for your nonprofit, this is a reference for them for what they should do specifically, as opposed to them trying to figure out what a color might be. And then the final point is, is to talk about rebranding. And the big question is, you know, when is the right time to rebrand? If you've got a nonprofit that's dated. Your, your last rebranding was 20 years ago and you're having a tough time persuading today's culturally uh, changed communities to, to donate or to volunteer, that it's probably a good time to think about rebranding. Do the SWOT analysis I talked about before and that's in the nonprofit guide and that'll give you a good perspective. So you've got my contact information here um, and again the, the link to the, to the nonprofit branding uh, 13,000 word guide. It's free. Grab it and there's information uh, from that guide about our gift back program as well. So let me um, shift now to the example. So about 19 of you, I think, were kind enough to share examples with us of your nonprofit branding. And, and we're going to walk through them. So, so this is um, going to be a little bit more challenging than normal because um, ultimately we uh, it'd be easier if we could talk about it but as long as you type I think we can we can we can do just fine with it let me just move this window away so that it's not in your uh, in your view um, so this is and by the way if we don't get through all of these that's okay I'll provide feedback to to everyone who asks for branding we have about 19. And I'll ask Samantha to share it with the whole group so that you have the benefit of that conversation. But using the foundation we just talked about, let's just start by uncovering what we like, don't like, uh, what could be improved about this nonprofit's website. Um, feel free to type in chat your, your feedback or, or in Q&A your feedback so we can talk about it. Um, the one thing I'll say globally, and, and this is really important, when I ask for people to share elements of their brand identity, um, everybody provided a logo and some people provided a link to their website, but nobody provided anything else. Remember again, and I want to reinforce it, everything visual about your brand, Twitter, Facebook, your marketing materials, your business cards, anything you create that people see is part of your brand identity. So don't just think your logo is it. You need to be concerned with, with everything around it. All right, let me see if I could figure out um, where the conversations are. All right. so. This is, this is the time for all of you. So um, we've got a comment from Alex. Uh, really like that watch is, is bolded. So it gives a little bit of, of element uh, to that logo and, and ultimately focuses on, on one element. One question that, that, that raises is watch the right 
place to bold uh, from a storytelling perspective. In other words, watch isn't, isn't really such a, a critically relevant word in the concept of watershed and salmon. Uh, it's potentially not nearly as important as those two other words. So it's nice to have a logo that has some elements, particularly when you have four words in that logo, but definitely think about you know, ways you can, you can focus on the most important elements. Um, comments about the, the uh, waves that they are evoking a nice feeling. So part of the storytelling, remember, uh, that you need to do uh, is, is to create a feeling for people that are, that are coming to your site or they're engaging with you elsewhere about the nonprofit and its mission. So, uh, so John, John says, um, like the logo and the design, but the text and section is too simple. And that's, and that's a really good observation. Remember that storytelling is a big part of what you need to do. So when you think about back to the slide, which said, you know, who are you? What's your mission? Um, you know, what does your nonprofit do? Um, and, and, and what do you want from me? This is what people think when they get to this page. And ultimately you created this page for donors, for volunteers, for the general public. So I think that's, that's probably pretty important. Um, Laura uh, talks about the gray blurry part of the top, which she assumes is a, is a salmon. Um, so this is the, the image at the top, right above the first wave that you can see. And, and I also have the same reaction. I think that's a good observation. One important element for visuals, for, for images, pick images that do several things. First of all, they need to be clear and unambiguous. Second of all, they need to explain the story that you're telling. Again, we relate to images 60,000 times faster than we relate to words. But, and here's the kicker, when an image isn't crystal clear, our brains start this process of trying to figure out what it is. And then when we read the words, you don't have our full focus. And so uh, Laura, and I'm sure a bunch of other people and I, were looking at that image, trying to figure out what is it? Is it salmon? Is it, is it, uh, is it leaves? And so, so it may be apparent to some people, but if it's not apparent to everybody, I think we, I think we can do better there. Uh, let me just pick a few comments, but I mean, you're going to have the chat, hopefully transcript from everybody. There's some great comments uh, coming in and I think these, these are outstanding. Uh, so so um, Heather says the way the intro paragraph is aligned doesn't feel optimal for a website. It looks like a Word document. And that's, that's, not an unfair, that's not an unfair statement. It doesn't necessarily look like a Word document, but it makes it harder to read. So one of the mistakes people make in visual design, and this is something that's pretty easy to correct, but you have to be conscious of it, and hopefully you all now understand it, is they optimize for weird things, but not for readability. You want to optimize for readability. People read a certain way, and people like to have information presented in a certain way. People like to have hierarchy of information. So for example, if the only thing I did when I get to this page is read just the text that's big, standing up for BC wild salmon, thriving while salmon runs across BC forever, stand with us to defend wild Pacific salmon, that tells a story. That's part of the story. The rest of it should reinforce everything else. So how you position your text is just as important as the other elements of your visual design. Um, let's see. I think lots of, um, lots of, lots of good comments. Um, I'll, I'll say one other thing about, about this and then we'll move out We'll move on to, to a Twitter example. Uh, Watershed Watch, Sam said he didn't provide it, but I, but I grabbed it from Twitter just to make a couple of points. Make sure your navigation is very clear. You know, front and center, try to answer the most important questions that people are going to have. The most important question isn't donate, which is smartly why donate is to the right, not close to the logo. The most import, important question is, you know, what the organization is about uh, and, and their work and how can I get involved. Uh, great to put stories because people love stories. It's really important for every nonprofit to create stories or case studies of what they do because it does several things. First of all, back to what I said earlier, people love stories. Stories can be very powerful, but the second thing stories do, case studies, is they help your volunteers and donors 
explain your nonprofit, its mission, its vision. If you don't tell these stories, then you're relying on volunteers and donors to come up with an explanation. And as hard as they try, they're rarely gonna have the same in-depth understanding of what you're doing as you do. So this is a good chance to help them. Um, there's a question from Nancy, is there an ideal minimum size for a font size? It's gotta be readable. And it's got to be readable in a lot of different displays. So for example, on crowdspring.com, our average font is 16 pixels, which is bigger than normal. A lot of sites use smaller fonts. So the fonts here aren't necessarily bad, but, but one of the challenges with, with text is you've got to find different ways to treat it. Size is only one of those ways, whether it's bold, how you actually organize it. Sometimes you'll use a different color shade to separate certain texts. And you'll see that when you come to the CrowdSpring site and, and read the nonprofit guide, we do all of those things. So make the font bigger than what you normally see in commercial sites, because at the end of the day, people struggle reading tiny print and they give up on it. Um, and, and what used to be true for websites, everybody used tiny fonts to pack a ton of information is no longer true. There's one other reason why bigger fonts are better. People don't spend a ton of time reading websites. So, uh, you need them to be able to comfortably read your story quickly without struggling to figure out what it says. Okay, um, lots of great feedback. Twitter, so, so this is, this is uh, their Twitter account. And again, I, I wanted to use this as an example to show you that your brand identity covers everything that you do visually. So don't, don't assume that you have a logo you love or a website you love and you're done. Everything across should, and it includes the, the verbiage you use. So you have, you have a logo, and, and one thing that you see here is it's a different logo than what we saw on the website. So compare this logo and, and the logo here. There are similar elements, and that's okay, uh, but, but, but they're different. The challenge when you get into social networks is that logo, when you look at it in this first post, is impossible to read. You just can't read what it's about. I have no idea that, that there are the word salmon society appear below. I may be able to read watch, and I suspect many of you can read watch, but what's above watch, we can't see. We could see it in the big version, but not in the actual avatar. The lesson here is that if you want to tell stories through your avatars and other elements of your visual identity, find a way to include something that tells a story without that confusion. So for example, if the salmon was unique and told an interesting story, just that by itself would be sufficient without spending time including the name of the organization because the name is unreadable anyway. And you wanna educate people about relating to the image. The Red Cross, if we saw a cross, most of us would think, the Red Cross, and that's the whole idea that we want to try to communicate. So lots of good feedback for, uh, for the hero image here. The hero image should underscore what you're trying to do and the story you're trying to tell. And this is a great example of, of a group of kids and, and, and maybe a mom uh, telling them something about the area. So, so it underscores and continues your story. Um, there's a, a little blurb here about what the Watershed Watch Sam Society is. Um, and and that's, that's good. You might consider a call to action of some sort there because this is your opportunity to get somebody over to your site, learn more about us by visiting our site uh, or consider volunteering or consider donating, whatever it is that you want to do. Uh, so so lots, of, lots, of, lots of great examples. Okay, let's look at the next one, Compass Center. So let me, let me scroll down a little bit so you have a little bit more context and, and it's the same exercise. Let's, let's react and, and see if we can help um, distill what, what's good here, what can be improved and how. Maybe let's start at the top. Let's focus on the logo first. So one comment from, from uh, Tanya is the logo is a bit bland and, and that's a fair statement. So, so at the end of the day, one of the challenges with, with um, literal logos, you know, compass setter, and you've got a compass uh, is, is that it's, it's, 
it's, it's hit and miss. At the end of the day, it becomes probably more generic than most people want. It's, it's, it's maybe memorable because there are not a lot of businesses named Compass, but, but when you use an element that is um, uh, generic, uh, it creates a little bit of friction. So uh, I, I think that's a, that's a fair comment. Um, comment from Mel, like that it's easy to read and, and it is. One of the challenges though, so, so the hero, which is the top where the butterfly sits and you've got breaking the cycle of sexual and domestic violence, you know, that's an important place because when people land on this page, they're gonna see it first. But, but I'll point out a couple of things that are challenging here. I am looking at this on a 30 inch monitor. So you're viewing it in your screen I'm not sure if you're seeing my whole screen. I suspect you are because of the way Zoom compresses everything. But imagine somebody with a laptop getting to this page. They're probably not going to see breaking the cycle of sexual and domestic violence. They'll see Compass Center. They'll see some or all of the butterfly. And that's a challenge because it means that your core message isn't visible to the person when they first visit the page. It means you haven't answered anything about what you do, your mission, those are all important things. So one way to tell a better story is to consider a narrower hero image. It doesn't have to be as tall. It could be smaller and narrower so that a person on a laptop can see exactly what you do when they land at this image. The second part of this is it has to tell part of a story. So breaking the cycle of sexual and domestic violence is a powerful statement, but I think many people will be confused. Is this organization breaking the cycle of sexual and domestic violence? Is this a blog post about this topic? Be very specific in how you communicate what you do, what your mission statement is. Um, and, and if the mission statement is a statement, if this in fact is the mission statement, then, then I would push you to talk human. Talk to the person who's visiting the page and say, this is what we do, or this is how we do it. This is what our mission is about. Um, a good comment from, from both Nancy and, and Riley about the tagline, that it's, it's really small and not readable, navigating the journey to healing. And that, that's a fair comment. If you've got an element in your logo that, that acts as a, as a tagline, which this does, uh, make sure it's readable because if it's not readable, we looked at the Twitter example together before where the avatar in a small size was, was mostly unreadable. If it's not readable in your logo, it misses the point. You haven't actually done anything to educate. Um, so let's see. Um, Heather makes a good point. Appreciate that the imagery is not triggering for survivors. And that's, that's, a, that's a good point. I mean, be sensitive, obviously, to people that could come to your site, because especially if you're dealing with, with very sensitive issues, these could be triggers for people. And so um, it's good to look for imagery which they could relate to. And part of understanding that imagery, and you'll see in the nonprofit branding guide, part of the understanding for that imagery is for you to talk to people that are potential volunteers, potential donors, people that you can potentially help and share some examples of what you're thinking of doing or what you're currently doing and see what their reactions are. Um, because there's, you know, a great symbolism to, to a butterfly and, and, and a few of you have picked up. Uh, so, so some, Samantha, you know, mentioned good symbolism behind a butterfly. Um, and there's some, some good examples of, of, you know, some of the graphics used, used below. Um, but, but part of the challenge is, is again, go for readability. So if you think about like this part of the page, we scroll down a little bit to the, to the truth, the harsh truth. There are five graphics here, and there's a, a, a quote from a survivor's open letter, and there are some interesting stats, but the stats are really tough to read. So the graphics are fine, but the important content here is the copy. So the green graphic is one in four homes aren't happy as yours. That's a, a great and powerful statistic, but it needs to be bigger. You need to be able to read it. It has to tell part of the story. Um, the one below it, one in 15 children has bigger worries than waiting for, for recess. There are two issues here that I would encourage you to think about. Again, very tiny font, very tough to read. The second is contrast. When you pick colors, find contrast combinations that maximize readability, particularly because for most nonprofits, 
your target audience are going to be people who are a bit all older. You know, younger people are socially minded, they're civically minded, hopefully, uh, but they're not yet, you know, minded to donate. And so, so it's a tougher audience for most nonprofits to reach from a donation perspective. And so as people get older, we naturally, you know, our eyesight isn't as good. Uh, many of us wear glasses. It's just harder to read and contrast uh, problems create even more friction, especially obviously also for those that are colorblind. So white on red in this case, when it's this small, very difficult to read, even though the message is very powerful. Um, so um, there's a comment about the crisis hotline it, it is great, but could be a, a, a trigger at the top. And, and ultimately there's a question of what the emergency exit is. Uh, which is a fair statement. Remember, if you put something in your visual design, be sure that it's clear what it is. Because if we were to ask each of us in this conversation, what is the emergency exit? I might say it's a way to get out of this website quickly. Uh, but in reality, it might be something totally different. So be sure the words you use for the actions you expect people to take are, are very specific. And if, if it's confusing, get rid of them. Okay, um, Twitter account um, for the Compass Center. So we're just gonna do two Twitter accounts and the rest are gonna be websites. So again, we've got, we've got a, um, and, and hopefully, I actually don't know if it's, if it's the same Compass Center ultimately, because this is part of the challenge. I, I believe um, I pulled it right off of, right, right off of the bottom. Uh, but, but there are two things that are prevalent. First of all, notice how the logo on the main site differs from the avatar. Uh, different icon, different mark to explain it, uh, which is already a friction because we don't know if it's the same organization. And again, the same issue with the actual avatar is used when you see it a little bit lower. Uh, you can't read anything. You can't read the name. You can't read the wording below the name you can hardly see the branches that you're looking at. And so that's, that's really, really challenging. And, and the question is, what does that hero image connect with? Are these survivors? We suspect not. Are these people that support the agency, the staff, are these volunteers? We don't really know. And again, at the end of the day, find a call to action. Um, you know, learn more about you know, how to avoid sexual and domestic violence. Or, or donate or volunteer. These are things that get people to take some action. Now, this is not an active Twitter account. So, so uh, I want to point that out. This organization doesn't use it in the same way that we just saw earlier. But if you have a social presence, even if you're not active, be sure that A, it's connected. Two, if you rebranded and change the logo on your website, be sure you change it any, anywhere you are socially because you'll confuse people. Okay. Um, the next example, Santa Anonymous, 630 chat, Santa's Anonymous. So let's, let's start with some, some feedback. Let's, let's again focus at the top. Let's, let's start with the logo and, and maybe the hero and work our way down. I'll, I'll quickly scroll for you so you see the rest of the page in context. So um, one comment that's, that's really good for Ainsley is there's a lot at the top. There's a lot of copy, there's a lot of content, and that's a, that's a very fair point. Uh, part of the objective with visual design is to create a hierarchy of what's most important. So there are certain things that are important. There are other things that are less important. There are other things that are even less important. And I'll give you a good example on this page. This delivery day section, although you need some context to what it is, is nicely executed. You've got a countdown, you've got days, hours, and minutes, very easy to read. There's a lot of white space, and obviously the space around it is light blue, but we call it white space anyway because there's nothing in it. A lot of white space, it's nice and clean. This get involved section, similarly, you've got some nice clean icons. Maybe the fonts are a little small, but, but it's very clean and you see exactly what the hierarchy is. If I read nothing other than 
delivery day, donate money, donate toys and volunteer. I know exactly what this is about. And so this is very well executed. And, and I suspect that the, the Ainsley's point about, you know, the top is you've got a lot of things competing for your attention. So we tend to read top left to the right, but it's not across the screen. It's kind of like diagonally down. So we're not ever really making it across the screen most times, which means that we are competing for that attention. So by compressing the copy at the bottom against the hero, several things happen. It's harder to read the hero. When you first look at this page, what you want people to read is a simple wish to see every child receive a new toy at Christmas. But what many people will actually see is probably we're all in this together. Santa's Depot is currently closed due to the COVID-19 pandemic, simply because of the way that eye tracks down. When that butts into the picture, that's what happens. So be very careful about it. A um, lot of text, comments from, uh, from Inez. Uh, there's a lot of text here and, and that's fair. There is a lot of copy to process. And it's part of the same point that I just made that when you create visual hierarchies of what's important, some of this may be important lower down, but not necessarily so far up the top. Um, let's see, comments from, from Samantha, like the colors, light brew and gray and, and, and red versus white. Uh, because the white would have been too sterile and, and loves the logo because it pops. And I think those are all really good examples. Uh, for me, one of the confusing pieces in the logo is, is 630 Chad. Uh, it's not, I don't know what that is. And so, so part of what you should be doing is, is maybe somewhere telling that story of what it's about. Uh, so, so what is 630 Chad? Because Santa's, we get it. Santa's anonymous, most people get it. But, but what is the rest of that piece? And, and that's partly where you can tell the story. Um, Laura mentions the smiling face of the little boy and, and that's, that's, that's great. This is a good example of picking a nice photo that works really well with the content. So the content, a simple wish to see every child receive a new toy at Christmas, doesn't talk about smiling kids, um, but talks about every child who receives a new toy. Our brains make the other connection. People that get toys are happy. This is a great time for them. And the picture does that very nicely because it creates that nice association of a happy child who gets something. So, so really nicely done here. Okay, let's, uh, let's look at another one. So Elder Active. And again, just to remind you, if you submitted this and we don't have the time to finish this in, in this session, um, I will provide feedback uh, to all of the others and I'll share it with the rest of the group so you can all benefit from it. Um, so Elder Active, let me just scroll through it so you have some context for what it's about. So let's, let's again, maybe start at the top, but you're welcome to, um, to pick up what you want. There's lots of great comments. I'm, I'm picking up as they scroll. Uh, so if I don't pick your comment, it's not because I didn't like it. I think there's a tremendous amount of great insight. Um, it's just that I can't keep up with the scrolling. So, um, but definitely share because this is valuable, not only for the person who created uh, and runs this organization, but, but also for all the rest of you to understand how we perceive these things. Uh, so uh, Ainsley points out the logo is hard to read the pink and blue, yellow, white. And this is a logo that was created, you know, several decades ago, uh, if I remember correctly. And so ultimately uh, it, it needs some updating. One of the lessons that we've now talked about a couple times is favor readability, always. Okay, a designer might say this looks great, but if it's unreadable, something looking great doesn't ultimately help you. So in this case, there are a number of issues with the logo. One is just dated. It needs to be updated and modernized. But part of the issues is the elements beneath ERA, some of them look like letters and they make it virtually impossible to read what they are. And the letters have a three-dimensional sort of, you know, bordered outlook to them, which also makes them more difficult to read. So from a readability perspective, you've got those issues. And the combination of some of these colors and the way the colors transition from, from yellow to blue to white makes portions of these letters very hard to read. And so when we talk about memorable, when we talk about impactful, um, this is definitely a logo that can use an, an upgrade. 
Um, there's a comment from Jason, don't use initials in a logo. Uh, you're not IBM or, or AAA. It takes a lot of effort to build a brand around initials. And that's, that's a fair comment. Um, initials are really tough because they don't actually communicate your business, your nonprofit, your organization. They don't really tell anybody about what you do. And so if somebody says, I took a look at ERA, many people will say, you know, equal rights amendment, uh, because that's the initial that may, maybe they think about when they hear ERA. So when you brand your nonprofits, find ways to do it so that your nonprofit's name is front and center. And that's a good opportunity to improve that logo. Um, so good point from Jessica and a few others. If this is targeted at an older audience, shouldn't the navigation text be larger? And that's a fair point. You know, there's a question is, is the navigation sufficiently, sufficiently you know, clean and large? So for example, compare what we saw at Watershed Watch um, or what we saw at Santa's Anonymous, which is you know, significantly bigger and, and the smaller navigation elements here. That's a great point. If your audience is, is an older audience, then you need to take great steps to be sure that you are making the site accessible and easy for them to use. Um, Samantha's feedback is really likes the text on the hero image, uh, likes the topography and the, and the message. And I think that's, that's really fair. This is another example, by the way, of um, using a hero image that's really big. And, and so whenever you, whatever you do, take a few minutes and go visit your nonprofit page on a laptop and see what a person visiting on a laptop actually sees. If they don't see the actual copy that you want them to see when they land on your website, then you're not telling them anything. You're staying silent about your organization and many of them won't scroll down. So, so good copy, good font. Um, the one thing that you should be doing though, the, there's, there's some issues with the spacing uh, here. So, uh, you see how the second line and the third line all butt up against each other. So it's, it's hard to see the comma, it flows into the S. That's not a visual element, that's just not enough space left for readability. Now, the font is big, there are not a lot of words, so our brains adjust for that and read it, but, but it is a bit confusing visually and something that could be uh, very cleanly made up. Um, Let's see. There's a question if it's a good practice to have two calls to action in the header for minas. Um, and, and the answer is generally not, um, but, but it's, a, it's an answer with an asterisk. You wanna have a main call to action, but you can have a secondary call to action, just don't have two calls to action that appear to be identical in importance. So in this case, what are you really trying to do with this page? Are you trying to get somebody to become a member or somebody to volunteer? One of these should be more important than the other. The one that's more important can stay just as it is. The one that's less important doesn't need the identical treatment of the call to action that's more important. It could be just the word volunteer without a bracket to it. Um, or another way to do this that would be perfectly fine is Volunteer with a, with, with a figure around it is fine. Become a member, make it purple or pink, whatever that color is, and make become a member white. So you're using the inverses. One is gonna be much more powerful because it's more color and a clear message. The other will be secondary. So it's okay at times to have two calls to action, but do differentiate them visually. Um, there's a suggestion from Anna to maybe say, get involved, uh, which would be a general call to action to anybody who wants to get involved with their organization and then use a drop down to let you pick, become a member and volunteer. That's a good suggestion too. It's a way to remove the stigma of having two calls to action here that can be paralyzing and find a way to filter down. Okay, let's, uh, let's take a look at, um, let's see. You know, obviously important to talk about your mission somewhere on your homepage because that's what you want people to, to get away, uh, to take from it. Uh, it's, it's probably more relevant to have your mission closer to the hero. 
uh, than it is to have it closer to the bottom of the page because at the end of the day, that's what people want to know. What does your organization do? What is it about? At the end of the day, active in, by, uh, in body, mind, and spirit could also speak to a, a sports club. Uh, and, and so this isn't necessarily a sports club. So if the mission belongs probably a little higher. All right, let's take a look at the next one. Eastern Front Theater. So again, let me, um, and, and thanks everybody for submitting your assets. I know it's, you know, it's first of all, great feedback. We're all being constructive. I think this is immense help. Um, so, and I appreciate everybody be, be, being so forthcoming with, with ideas. Let me just scroll through so you get a sense for the overall site. But again, let's start at the top. So comment from Melanie, nice and clean, but can't read the text on the hero image. And that's a fair, fair statement. So there are challenges when contrast fails. And this is one good example. Blue on a lighter color, especially when you have a changing uh, gradient for that color, can become really hard to read. You have to struggle to figure it out. There are two at least two ways for you to solve for that problem. If the color blue is your core brand color, as it appears to be in this case, then you can either find a different image that works nicely with the color blue, or uh, three ways, you can use a different color here, or screen the image a little bit. In other words, use a screen that makes the image 50% less visible. To a person visiting the site, they'll still be able to see what it is, but it will significantly improve the readability of the copy in that hero image. Um, some, some comments about um, competing actions uh, in the navigation from Jason, you've got a lot of navigation elements. So one of the challenges with this particular design, and again, it goes to, you know, what are people gonna see and what's most important? Your logo takes up a huge amount of space here. It's big, it's centered, there's nothing else around it. And then the navigation takes two more lines, which means that half of a laptop screen is going to be looking at a logo and the navigation, which isn't ideal because you don't have a chance to tell your story. Uh, and that story is extremely important. So much easier to move the logo to where it traditionally normally is in a corner and create a, a cleaner navigation that maybe doesn't have this many elements. It is difficult to take things away from navigation, but as was suggested earlier, drop downs do a nice job of letting you put together items so that they can drop down and pick one of these items. The, the thing that you got to strive for is cleanliness and readability. Uh, that's most important. So for example, you've got 2021 season, 2019, 20 season. One of those far less important today. So that could easily be a drop down that defaults to 2021. And if you drop down, you can look at past seasons. So think about ways you can, you can put those together. Um, let's see, uh, comment from John, job opportunities should be in the footer. And that's, that's a really good example about navigation. So, so ask yourself the question, what is most important? You're not creating this website to hire people. Um, you're creating this website for a very specific reason. Anything that isn't critical to that reason, move it out, move it to the footer, move it somewhere else because it's competing for way, way too much attention. Um, some, some other suggestions on um, different colors for the site. And, and obviously, you know, if I were to, to, to look at the logo and, and, and critically evaluate it, uh, it's, it's really tough to understand what's going on in those letters. So uh, it looks to me like maybe waves, but I'm not sure how waves are, are you know, Eastern front, I get it, uh, but I'm expecting something a little different than when I get to the organization. Uh, potentially I'm expecting, you know, an organization focused on, on warfare or a theater focused on concept of war. And, and it may be that's the, the mission, but, but ultimately my expectation is probably not going to be accurate. So be sure the elements that you pick are all really well connected. All right. We're, um, um, so Samantha's saying we've got, we've got uh, an extra 30 minutes to keep talking. So I'm happy to, to go a bit over time. If people are happy to continue, we'll, we'll look at some other examples. Uh, uh, but ultimately, feel free to, by the way, to, uh, to ask questions. So if you've got some questions uh, and, and not comments, 
or maybe I'll, I'll tell you what, here's what we'll do. We'll, we'll keep going for about 10, 15 minutes and then we'll open it up for, for general questions because I think that'll, that'll let us um, have a conversation about some of these concepts. So how about, how about a little lower? So, so, you know, the rest of the site, some comments on, 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 um, on what we have here. So, so one comment from, uh, and John, yeah, we, we'll, we'll see if we can look at the around page next. Um, a comment from Jason, not clear where to focus. There's a lot of copy and content and, and here, and it's all, it's all words and it's not well separated. So find hierarchy and find ways to, to create the things that you want people to focus on. Because at the end of the day, you want them to read the things that you write, but if you give them five or six different things to read, they're not going to. Nobody's gonna invest the time to read every word on this page unless they somehow connect with those organization. And so what's most important is that you tell them visually what's important, what's more important. So Ainsley suggests maybe some more images or some icons to help separate some of the text and create a little bit more spacing. So use better white spacing to tell the story. Okay, let's, uh, let's take a look at Iran Charities next. So let me scroll down. Iran Charities Africa, okay, dot org. Okay, so Iran Charities Africa. And Heather, we'll try to get to, uh, we'll try to get to um, I'm Bridges, Bridges for Women. Okay, so feedback. So Ainsley asked the question, why there are two sites? Are they the same organization? Um, and uh, so that's you know, obviously something to, to think about. Maybe one of these is an older site, maybe one of these is a newer site, but, but ultimately that's, that's a fair question to ask. Uh, Andrea likes the images uh, explaining what they do. And, and, and I agree, remember that your goal is to tell a story. And, and if you do a nice job telling that story right when the person lands, uh, you've accomplished something that most nonprofits don't. Um, empowering women, inspiring hope, improving lives, you know, really nice way to explain exactly what you're doing. And you've got a, a good connection between the images. You've got two women cheering, you've got, you've got one woman with thumbs up, you've got, you've got a, a group uh, standing, for, um, uh, you know, a larger group. And it's a nice way to connect, you know, series of images to the, to the copy that you've created. One thing, as people comment more, is you've got, you've got some issues here with, with a ton of stuff at the top, this very you know, multi-line navigation and your social avatars are taking up a ton of space. And importantly, Donate Now is almost invisible. Uh, I know there's a button there. If I struggle, I see it's Donate Now, but it's, it's blue on blue and a very tiny icon. So if, if you want people to donate and it's important to put it at the top, uh, then you want to make it as visible as possible. So there's no ambiguity. But at the end of the day, you really should focus on one call to action. And, and here's a really good way to think about it. A person that gets to your nonprofit site, just like a person who gets to a business site, is not going to turn around in one minute and donate $1,000. It just doesn't happen that way. They're going to want to know more about your organization. They're going to see if they like your mission, if they like your vision, if, if you sound credible. And so it's great to say, check out our work or check out our stories. Um, that's a phenomenal call to action that would reinforce what's already going on in the hero. I would consider making Donate Now less visually interesting. I mean, at the moment, it's almost invisible but less visually interesting because the odds of somebody donating now are very tiny. 
um, they're going to need to spend some time with the organization. So you need to figure out a good flow for that. Um, there's a comment from Jason, uh, Oran Charities Africa listed above what we do is taking up unnecessary space um, above the fold. Uh, and so the logo already communicates it. Um, right, so, so Oran Charities Africa, if you look at the hero and then what we do, that space uh, in, the, in the middle, you know, it, it's not helping you tell the story. It's just repeating what you had up there. So be sure you're not duplicating the things that, um, that are not really helping you tell your story. Um, what we do section, really nice. Inez says it's a, it's a good section, immediate idea of what the work is. And it's very nice copy. You've got nice, simple icons that are easy. You've got good headlines. So if all I read is the headlines, it's easy. Um, and you've got good sections. One, one small little tip that all of you um, can use, when you write copy below headlines, so in healthcare, we strive to provide easy access healthcare to our community and surrounding rural villages. That copy should probably be a little closer together to each other. These read like headlines. They don't read like part of the same paragraph. And so if you bring them a little closer, it'll improve the readability of, of this page significantly, and it'll create just an easier way for somebody to glance at it and, 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 and evaluate. Okay, let's take a look at, um, uh, bridges for Women. So uh, again, I'll, I'll scroll. So this is the top and we'll take a look at the site in context. All right, so, so feedback on, on Bridges for Women. So there's a comment from John about why they had the text in between the, the Oran Charities text and that the goal was to use it for SEO. Um, at the end of the day, SEO is going to be mostly unimportant for nonprofits because it's going to be tough to compete on, on a lot of the topics that you care about. But, but there are ways to use words for SEO that don't compromise your overall design. So when you're telling your story, use your organization's name. Instead of saying we, you can say Orange Charities for Africa. Does the exact same thing from an SEO perspective, but it does it contextually. It doesn't compromise the design to do it. Okay, so um, some, some, um, some comments on this design. Uh, difficult to read the white text on uh, a blue and white background, and, and that's fair. It does, this is where, where things start compromising a little bit. A lot of people will see a bit of a doubling effect in, in, this, in this context. So uh, this image is already screened out a little bit. It feels like it's got, it's got a blue shade on it and there's a bit of screening. You could probably do more to screen it out um, so that it, you know, maybe 30, 40% more screen so that the image is still perfectly visible. You still know what it is, but the text is much easier to read because at the end of the day, it's important to be able to read things. The other thing that, that could help here is the navigation is, is set to the left. And, and there's probably an argument to be made to center the navigation here to give the page a bit more centering. Because at the moment, if you think about the page, there's a very heavy logo, it takes up a lot of space uh, and it's big. It doesn't need to be that big. But the combination of a heavy logo, a left-centered navigation and, and left-centered helping women build their lives pushes the eye in that direction very heavily and makes it really hard for somebody to glance at it. So one way to, to, to solve for that problem is center the navigation, center helping women build, rebuild their lives and the paragraph under it, because that's what the next piece of it is. But you've got to be, you know, obviously very clear um, about what you want to accomplish with this element. So, so at the end of the day, there are choices that you make that may relate to other, other uh, needs. And obviously we don't know all of them, just some suggestions. Um, not sure what the brand colors are blue and purple. So, so Jason says, you know, uh, purple is not a strong CTA color. Um, and ultimately uh, I'm not even sure that, that 
purple is a C, I mean, I'm not sure that we're, we're using purple for a CTA here because the only CTAs really are appearing below. Uh, well, one is in purple, one is in orange, one is in green. Um, you probably should find a way to, to have a call to action closer to the top, something about learning more to get people to, to scroll through the site and, and find some things. Um, so Heather, um, Heather sent a, a brand color document. And I'll give you a quick example um, of, of what that may look like. This is, this is part of a style guide. This isn't a style guide, but, but Heather was kind enough to share this. And this is what I meant earlier. So one of the things you should do is document exactly what colors you're using and the rationale for that. So that if somebody creates something for you, they have the hex color, the RGB color for website. They have the CMYK color and the Batone color. So they don't have to look for any of this stuff. They don't have to guess what it is. They know exactly what it is. Here are the secondary colors. And then you've got the type typefaces, the fonts that are being used, how to use those fonts and, and what to do. And so this is, again, part of the style guide. This isn't everything. In the nonprofit branding guide that I, that I um, uh, mentioned and, and you'll find at the top and, and on the last slide, you'll see a very detailed list of things that would normally go into a style guide. So this is a great example. I mean, think about if you're running a nonprofit and you don't have even this, you don't know what colors to use. So if a volunteer says, I'd love to create a sign for our next donation event, what colors do you use? And your answer is, well, I don't know, just it's purple. Uh, this is very specific. This gives you a chance to say, hey, the hex color is this, or if you're printing it, here's the CMYK color. This is exactly what the printer will need to be able to duplicate our color exactly as we intend to do it. So, so these are all, all good examples. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's maybe do one more and then we'll do, we'll do Q&A. Um, let's see, I think safety net was next on the list. So safety net children and youth charities. And um, I'll scroll through a little bit. So, so Ainsley starts off by saying pictures, please. And, and that's a great statement. Again, visual, 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 visual. So important for nonprofit brands because you want to tell stories and nothing can tell a story better than a great image. We saw that in some of these other examples. The right image makes it so much easier and, and puts a smile on our faces as we start reading the copy. And so it becomes a reinforcement when we read copy about what you do and the image already created that great interaction between us and what's, what you're talking about. We're already conditioned to receive the message in a much more useful way. Um, comment from Ainsley too, larger pictures on the lower uh, part of the page, which is probably accurate. There's space here to, to make each picture probably twice as large, so it's more visible uh, for people that get here, but that's not so critical if it's, if it's less of an emphasis. Uh, Brittany says the donate button uh, needs to stand out more. It's lost in the text, um, and, and that's, that's fair. Um, Honestly, I don't even know where the donate button is, is here uh, when I'm looking at it. So, so it, it definitely is lost. Um, again, this is a, you know, an example we saw in a couple of other areas. You've got a logo taking up a ton of space. Um, you've got a really long you know, tagline, helping people is what we do. We rely on community donations to provide free items and services to financially disadvantaged families. That should be your hero. You should have a nice image and a hero that's far bigger text and more readable. One other thing on copy, because this is something that most people don't understand. Copy is as important as visual design. The words you use are immensely important. So I'll give you one example. Helping people is what we do is a bit of an awkward phrase. It's not nearly as powerful as we help people, but both suffer from the same problem. Every nonprofit helps somebody. Most nonprofits help people. Some nonprofits help animals. Some nonprofits help the environment. So generic statements aren't going to tell a unique story. So when you write, first of all, be succinct and clear. Use the best and most powerful version of a sentence that you can write. 
But secondly, don't put in any copy that doesn't really advance your story, doesn't tell your story, doesn't, doesn't talk about your mission because it doesn't really help you. It just takes up space. Um, logo is very outdated from Jason, doesn't, doesn't have a smaller element that could be used on social or printed materials, and that's fair. You know, you've got an image, but that image might be tough to use in small avatars because it just isn't going to be as, as crystal clear as, as another image that's simpler. So as tempting as it is to try to tell an entire story in your logo image and your logo mark, it's hard because when you have a small version of it, it just can't do the job very quickly. Um, Julie points out some typos as you scan through the site. That's a good observation. Have somebody proofread your work. We all make mistakes. You know, I publish something that's a thousand words and there are probably 12 uh, spelling mistakes, even though I've looked at it four times and I could swear that I haven't made a single mistake. And, and then somebody else will look and say, yeah, here are the mistakes. So have somebody proofread it because ultimately it's about your trust and credibility with your audience. If they see a site that doesn't look professional and well put together, if they see spelling mistakes, if they see confusion, they're going to think less of what you do. They're not going to be as receptive to your message and that, that creates some, some friction. Okay, so let's stop here. I will, for the nonprofits that we didn't cover, put together some feedback and you should feel free to do this now on your own. Hopefully, my goal was to lay a foundation so you can all have this conversation and help each other. Um, and the comments have been phenomenal. So I know that, that you are uh, you're getting the, the message that I'm hopefully trying to communicate. So I'll, I'll provide some feedback to the ones we haven't talked about who, who wanted feedback. I'll share it with Samantha and she can share it with the whole group. But, but I'm happy to answer some questions for the next five to 10 minutes if, if people have them. I know we had a question earlier come in from Alex. What would be a rough estimate or range on rebranding cost and time? So, from a branding perspective, costs can be all over the place um, and you've got lots of options. There is a, a good guide uh, that I'll share with you. Let me type it in and then I'll, I'll mention a few things. If I could type, I'm, I'm using a, not my normal keyboard here, which of course is already causing me a headache. Well, okay, I'm not sure exactly. So I've been a Mac user for, for 12 years, but I still can't give up PC keyboards. So it's crowdspring.com slash cost of design is a guide to how much logo design costs, how much web design costs, how much brochure design costs. Uh, that'll give you cheap, free, affordable, and expensive options. But, but a general answer is this. Uh, one of the reasons we started CrowdSpring was to make design affordable for nonprofits, for, for small businesses. And so, you know, freelancers can charge in the thousands of dollars. And of course, you've got free options with online logo generators. This is an area, if we go back to where we started the conversation, you know, getting something free and cheap is free and cheap, but it's going to cost you in the long term. It'll make it much more difficult to tell your story. It'll make more difficult to fundraise. Um, it'll make it more difficult to find volunteers. And so um, logo design projects on CrowdSpring, for an example, are $299. And if you take a look at our give back page and, and register there, um, if you're not selected for a free project, we'll give you a, a, a big discount off of that 299 that includes all fees of the award of the winning creative so you could find freelancers that'll that'll uh, you know charge you 500 1000 multiple thousand dollars you can work with agencies that are going to charge you multiples of that uh, but it meant rebranding is more than a logo so you're talking about you know business cards marketing materials website what i would say is do it in stages it starts with your name you need to have the name you need to have a logo because the logo and your name influence all the other elements, the colors and everything else. So don't think like a big company that rebrands overnight. When Uber rebranded, they spent you know, many, many millions of dollars and all of a sudden their new branding was everywhere. Nonprofits can't 
do that. It's really tough to do. So if you want to rebrand, think of it as a process that'll take a series of months or even the next year, but start at the foundation. Is the name right? If it is great, is the logo, is the logo right? If you can improve it, let's get a new logo and let's start moving forward and doing things in the other areas. I think I have a question from me, and um, it's just reflective of the work that we do with nonprofits. Obviously, everyone is very strapped for resources, strapped for time, wearing many hats, but why, why from you is it important to focus on branding? Well, it's the single best way. Branding is the single best way that, that any organization can stand out today. So, so branding connects with the storytelling. Branding connects with the people with whom you're talking. And at the end of the day, if you think about, you know, what is a logo? A logo does two things. And whether it's a nonprofit or a for-profit company, a logo creates an expectation. It's your expectation of what that brand is about. And part of the reason you have that expectation is the brand has spent time telling a story. So when we see a logo for Apple, we, we have a certain expectation about the products they're gonna create. If we see a logo for United Way, we have a certain expectation about the work that they've done because they've told us about their mission. The second thing a logo does is it creates an emotional reaction in your brain. And that emotional reaction, if it's positive, gets you to pay more attention to the brand, gets you to remember things the brand says more. And if it's negative, it does the opposite. So if we see a poorly designed logo and it's a negative chemical reaction in our brains, we just ignore the other things. We, we don't find any credibility in the other things the nonprofit says, and we tend to dismiss it very quickly. On the other hand, if it looks nice, if the picture's underscored, we are far more trusting. We are far more willing to read more we're far more willing to consider the mission to donate to volunteer, which is why when we looked at these examples, some of them that connected the stories and the images and, and the actions did such a nice job engaging us, whereas others did some things really well and some things obviously can be improved. Thanks, Ross. That was insightful. And I know a lot of nonprofits are definitely running away now, checking out their donate buttons, their text colors. So you've given everybody a lot to think about. Um, if there's any final questions, just pop them into the chat box now. We've got a comment from Dave saying, Ross, thank you for your understanding the audience you have here. Your input is awesome. Well, thanks, Dave. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to hear that. I mean, again, the goal is this is different than any session you're going to have. This is, you know, all of you did the hard work. Uh, I, just, I just pointed out a few things uh, here and there. But, but this hopefully gives you the comfort to be an expert on your own site, be an expert for a colleague who runs a nonprofit and say, hey, can you do this for my site and I do this for your site? Let's do a critical evaluation. You now hopefully have a good foundation. And with the nonprofit guide, I think you'll learn a lot more too. You'll be able to improve how you talk and, and hopefully improve all of the other goals, your, your funding, your, uh, your volunteers, and, and the way that you communicate your story to your, uh, to your audience. Uh, uh, we had a see. question come in from Ainsley. Do you have tips? Do you have tips for getting non-marketing staff on board with brand? Yes. So, so Ainsley, in in the um, in the nonprofit branding guide, we spent some time talking about it. When you go through the exercise of figuring out your brand, if you're launching a new nonprofit, or if you have an existing nonprofit and you're considering rebranding, your staff is part of that process. They are some of the people with whom you're talking about the nonprofit. Because remember, it's everything visual about your brand that other people perceive. That includes your staff. Your staff are some of your best ambassadors. They are the people that will be talking to volunteers, to donors. Uh, and so, so absolutely, ask them questions. You're gonna do interviews with them to understand how do they perceive your nonprofit? What are your weaknesses? What are your strengths? And so, that conversation does two things. First of all, it gets them involved in the process, which, which doesn't typically happen. Typically, marketers will create a brand identity and say, here it is, everybody use it. And then everybody reacts and says, whoa, this really isn't our organization. So getting them involved early is really helpful. Number two, far more important, they have a lot to contribute. They know a great deal about your organization and it's really valuable input. It doesn't mean you do every single thing they say, but if you have a conversation 
I think you'll learn a lot more, just like you're learning from each other in this conversation. Even though you're all coming to learn about brand identity and how to build strong branding, you're all learning from each other. This is how you can go about it, learning from your staff. All right, thank you so much. I think that is all of the questions. Just so everybody doesn't miss it, uh, Mel's popped the nonprofit branding guide link into the chat. So grab that while you can. I'll give everybody a couple minutes while I share my last screen. And again, I just want to say a big thank you to Ross and Jason from CrowdSpring. Their input was fabulous. I think everybody's definitely learned a lot. Um, we will sign off here. I think that's all the questions that have come in. Um, just a reminder, there'll be a three question survey at the end of the presentation. It's anonymous and we would love it if you could share your thoughts about the session. Um, besides your feedback shaping future conferences to be more catered to you, I'm sure Ross would love to hear the feedback that you have for him versus what he's been giving you. So give that a minute. Um, otherwise, we will see you in about uh, 40 minutes for our next Lunch and Learn with Cindy Wagman. Uh, you can register for that session using the link that Mel's just popped into the chat. And I'll pass it back over to you, Ross, for any final words. Sure. I just want to wish everybody good luck. You're doing phenomenal things. It's always humbling when I look at, you know, this list of the 19 that asked. I know there are many, many of you that, that, that uh, um, didn't have an opportunity to su submit your, your website or your branding, but, but you're doing so many wonderful things to help others. And, and it's, it's really encouraging. Thank you for, for that and, and uh, keep up the good fight. And hopefully this gives you a chance to tell a better story. All right. Thank you so much, everybody, and have a great day. Bye-bye. All right. Goodbye.